المسلمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Let me just explain the topic first The topic is about knowing and not about knowledge And there's a reason I chose that topic uh, because knowing is an ongoing process and it has several, <coughs> several steps to it. Whereas knowledge might be an ongoing process or it might not be. So you get a package of knowledge that you, that you, that you uh, thoroughly understand and uh, absorb, memorize, and then you're done with that package. And that might be the end of the road for you as far as knowledge is concerned. But knowing is, is a process of growing as a human being. And at various levels of your life, you grow, but not in the same way. And the growth that you undergo at point A, which is different from the growth that you undergo at point B, is given a different name. And all of these things I have looked at uh, come from the Quran itself. <coughs> On the one hand, when we, you and I speak, we're not very uh, careful or picky about using one noun as opposed to some other noun. So, you know, say something is bright and something is sparkling, uh, we use it interchangeably. Something, if someone is light-skinned, someone is fair. And it's quite often that human beings use such nouns, adjectives, and so on, interchangeably. But in the Quran, one of the key elements of tafsir, apart from simply understanding what the text is telling you on face, is the wisdom of understanding why in verse A, the two words come in a particular sequence and in verse B, it comes in a different sequence. In another place, it's slightly different. So, because we believe as Muslims, this is from Allah, and that Allah picks his words carefully, and that every choice and every positioning is also embedded with a meaning, which is not something that you would find even in the most exhaustive tafsirs, unless you go into, into a tafsir that actually focuses on that. For the most part, if you go into a tafsir, they, they don't look at that. They give you an overall understanding of a verse. Or a single word is mentioned in this particular verse, not mentioned in the other verse. From our perspective, that's very important. Very important. Because this is from Allah himself. And so when he makes that particular choice, or he makes an omission here, but not there, there must be some deep wisdom in it. And so we lose it. So today we'll be picking up on some words in the Quran. And it's not exhaustive, I've just done a sampling. And each of these words has something to do with knowledge. But each in its own way. Now as a scholar of tafsir, you might disagree with my interpretation and you have the right to do that. But you can only do that if you are willing to suggest a different explanation of why that word is used and not that word. So this is about trying to uncover the multiple meanings of the Quran just by looking at these words. That's number one. Number two, knowledge is very important in our world today. in almost every field. And knowledge is perhaps the single human accomplishment 
that has been empowered in a way that we've never empowered it in the past. I'll give you two examples. One is that knowledge is today the most monetized commodity that human beings engage in. The most monetized commodity that anyone engages in. It's sad but true that if you go to an A-rate university, you're doing that for, for multiple reasons. So if, you know, God willing, you end, you end up, well, obviously not you, you're way past, but your kids maybe, your grandkids, in, some, in Caltech, for instance, then apart from the fact that you're going to get a, a good, very good education there, the charm of Caltech is more in two ways. The California Institute of Technology is highly attractive for two more reasons. One is the prestige of being a graduate of Caltech. And the second is the increase in income or salary as a result of that particular degree. And if you look at all, if you look at the statistics out, statistics out there, anyone who graduates from University A, as opposed to B, as opposed to C, will not be earning the same salaries. If you look at all of those who go to the, who are hired by FANG, you know, Facebook and Netscape and all of these big guys, they all, they all fish within a very small pool. So there is that element to it. So money, money, uh, knowledge has been monetized. And then knowledge has been weaponized. Think about how we have won wars as, in, as the United States. We have become so skilled in using knowledge to create sophisticated armaments that literally we sit in, we go to work in our homes. We ha have a special room in which we lock ourselves. That room is filled with computers. You turn on your computer and they give you a location somewhere in Afghanistan and you're supposed to take out a convoy that is gonna go, be passing through the Helmand province at 2.30 p.m. in the afternoon and that's your job. And when you're done with that, and after you have, uh, uh, what is the fancy term we use? We know, you know, the word kill is, 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 uh, is a swear word. You don't use that word. Eliminated. So once the target has been eliminated, you go back to drinking your coffee. And when you think about war, you think about, you think about sweating and bleeding and going through, you know, rough territory. You don't think about having a, a, uh, a, 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 a cup of coffee next to you and a donut and click a button. That's knowledge. It is knowledge that has enabled you to take that which was gruesome and toilsome into something that is just mechanical and even boring. But here's what we don't, we are not taught in, in our schools. And I think this applies even to Muslim schools. The, the, the elements that I will be talking about today, from an Islamic perspective, are not taught to us anyway. We have a very static, functional approach to knowledge. In Islam, there is a knowledge that is instinctive, that comes from the instinct. It's embedded in your genes. And when, you are, when your body or your, your senses are activated, then you do that which is instinctive. And the best example for all of us here, because we are all uh, privy to this, is when a child starts sucking on the breast of a mother for the first time. That's instinctive knowledge. It comes with the package of birth. It's not taught. 
it's not taught. I think they do put their fingers into it. Women can pr probably tell us more about this. They do kind of tease the child by putting the finger into the, the mouth. But then within a 10 or 15 seconds, that child is good to go, and they know exactly that this is how you. So this is how we, this is a package with which we grow. We have, a, we, may, we might even have an instinct for fear, and so on. But that's the very beginning of it. It ends at some point, or there's some instinctive qualities that stay with us. Then we have just experience, tajriba, which we pick up along the way. We look at how something is done. We get hungry for the first time when Adam alayhi salam is created, for instance, and you see a bird eating from the tree, and you draw two conclusions. That that is a resource to fulfill your hunger, and it's not harmful. So you eat the same thing. It's not like, you know, people, people were born, even at that time, created by Allah, and given a ledger and says, well, this is what you eat, this is what you don't eat. This is how you eat, kill an animal, and so on. The Quran makes a fantastic example of that. Where? In the story of who? Cain and Abel. Remember the story? He kills his brother. He doesn't know what to do with the body. What does that tell us? The first killing that takes place on this earth. So a first experience for us. Instinct doesn't kill in, kick in because we don't have that experience. So Allah sends down two birds. And they act out this drama. And then the bird teaches the man that if someone dies, whether you kill that person deliberately or he dies naturally, then that bird ought to be interred this way. This is what you would call experience, tajraba. When we start experimenting with that tajraba and we start tweaking it, in the 19th and the 20th century, what do we call that? We call it science. We call this very same experience that we have science. Because we now know what, when, when, what's this rigor mortis sets in. We know when the body starts to decay. We know what, to, what the temperature of the, of the fridge should be to keep that body health. All of those things are added to this package that we have of tajraba. And so we, 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 that, this is exactly how human beings have accumulated this knowledge over their thousands, ten thousands, Allah knows best, maybe a million years, we don't know. And then we have this formal knowledge, ilm, which the Quran speaks about copiously. وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ And Allah is the one who teaches you the, Quran, the, the kitab, teaches the Prophet sallallahu Several references, formal education. From learning the alphabet, to learning numbers, to learning architecture, medicine, whatever it is, formal education. Which has undergone its own changes throughout history. Formal education in the 7th century was different from that in the 10th century, different from that in the 12th century, and right down now to the 21st century. But we still, we had a certain amount of formal training. And it was generally connected to our occupations. Generally, not always. It is only in the modern world where your occupational training is the most important training a human can undertake. This is a huge revolution that has taken place. In the 20th century, the more, because of the Industrial Revolution and the rise of technology, the rise of medicine, suddenly you have mass education, you have compulsory education, and you have subjects that you must learn as, a, a subject, as opposed to subjects that are ancillary, like you have to know what? Mathematics, I mean language, English, or German. You don't have to know what geography. That has changed. But every child on the face of this earth is being taught the same thing. 
This was not the case in the 17th century, in the 10th century. There were no mass schools. Because your, 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 your way of earning a living was different. So this is formal knowledge. When you acquire enough formal knowledge, I'm going through these things very quickly in, in the interest of time, so it can give you some time to ask me some questions as well. When you uh, acquire enough experience and you acquire some knowledge and you have common sense and that common sense is then infused with, with some divine tincture, you know, coloration, sibra. Then you acquire what you would call hikmah. There is no college, there is no madrasa, there is no Islamic institution that teaches you hikmah. And when everything is said and done, it is perhaps one of the most, the second, second most important tool a human being can have in his possession. The difference between ilm and hikmah, remember I taught, recited that verse to you, وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam al-kitab and along with it, hikmah. One explanation, which is very common amongst the ulama, that the hikmah here is the sunnah, hadith. But if that is the actions and the performances and the thought processes of Rasulullah himself, then it's just what he did. It's not what he was taught as such. Hikmah is that property that a, some human beings have of being able to determine what to do during a moment of crisis. And all of us have had that experience. I like to, to, to present it in the way of a, someone riding around a road and then you get to a fork. So all this way that you drove was all based on ilm. When you get to this point, you have to decide whether you're going to take this route or this one. That decision that you make, that decision that you make will be based on your hikmah. And not everyone can get it right. And not everyone can get that right. Simple examples of hikmah would be who should you marry? Who should you marry? What we do as a community, we, we facilitate things by, well, now we don't do that anymore, but previously, find a girl and you know, do an elimination process, or find a man and do an elimination process. Is there compatibility? Does he have any negative qualities? Does he have some bad behavior? Are there any lingering things in his family that you and I should know about? We all go through that. That's not hikmah. At the end of the day, you're, still, you're, still, you're going to end up saying, well, should I or shouldn't I? So there are multiple moments in your life and my life where we have to make choices. And the choice we make is a combination of your experience, your, that's your tajraba, your ilm, and then hopefully you have the hikmah for it. Hopefully you have your, the hikmah for that. Not an easy thing to do. If you've ever been asked to make, to, to make that decision, as a doctor, for instance, as a surgeon, should I or shouldn't I? Should I or shouldn't I? There is a likelihood that I can save this person or save this limb or save this organ. How do I make that decision? Science, medicine, your colleagues have given you a repertoire, all of this stuff. But at the end of the day, you will be calling the final shot. You will be calling the final shot. Big people get in, get, are asked to make this decision at the highest level. Should, go, should we or should we not go to war? Should we or should we not go to, to, to war? Ironically, I don't like using the Prophet ﷺ as examples in some cases 
because he was all he he had direct access to ultimate knowledge we know that we know that from the fact that sometimes if he made the wrong choice he would be prompted so rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is sitting there in the house and the father brings his daughter in and the father is complaining about the son the husband he says what happened he says he slapped my, my daughter so he did so yes so rasulullah said in that case you go back home and slap him go back home and slap him that was a decision he made astaghfirullah i shouldn't be saying this but i he made based on his 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 essential fairness you know that all human beings should be treated the same male or female he for a moment there didn't pay attention to what the power dynamics between the male and the female the power dynamics between a male and a female if that becomes the standard and every time a husband raises his hand to his wife she is given the option of responding in kind you and i know where that's going to end in the emergency room so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends down a verse and as the couple a father and daughter are walking out rasulullah calls him back he says i made a decision and allah made the greater decision الرجال قوامون على النساء من اذ ان ذات اي ثينك اتس فور ذس ون او اول الرجال عليهن درجه ويذا ون اوف ذيس تو فيرسز وير ريفيل بيكوز اوف ذس سو ذن ذا بروفيت صلى الله عليه وسلم قال له باك اند سيز نو دونت دو ذات سو ذس از ان اكزامبل اوف وير سام تايمز يو يو هاف تو سي اول رايت وين يو توك سنه الله الله از دايركتلي كونكتد تو رسول الله اول ذا تايم وي دونت هاف اكسس تو ذات So when we get to these forks in life when we get to these forks in life we have to make a decision and it's a very difficult decision to make staying with divorce you have a daughter whose marriage is is, is not good what do you do what do you do she wants to stay with him or she doesn't want to stay with him how do you make that decision on what you can come to me you go to hafiz sahab he'll give you some general advice the problem with us is we don't have what the direct internal knowledge of it or what actually goes on inside that house so we can quote a verse of the quran and we can quote a, a hadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and and that's about it you have very good a very good understanding of what goes on there you have a better understanding than anyone and yet even there you have to make the choice so this is hikma wa may yu'ti al-hikmata faqad utiya khairan kathira and those who have been given wisdom hikma have been given khair kathir khair kathir it's given you goodness in plenitude not everybody gets it what choice should we make i wish before i move on think about the painful experience you've undergone here in this masjid with this community for the past 4 or 5 years and you when you and i know it's painful to re- replay but if you replay it says you know what if we had made choice a instead of choice b what if we had done this instead of that i understand you can't do what what is it called monday morning call quarterbacking right but uh, it's the hikma that that drove us to make a choice rather than another choice so you have to always remember the need for hikma and ask allah to give you to give you that hikma it is not taught anywhere in this world not in a secular institution not in an islamic institution 
something that comes straight from Allah. And the last one is basira. The interesting thing about this word basira is it, apply, it appears about 11 times, I think, in the Quran. In all nine times in there, it's, it's basira of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In two places, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about basira being given to man. Basiratun ana wa man ittaba'ani. How does it go? Ad'u ila Allah. I'm inviting unto Allah. Based on basira. Ana wa man ittaba'ani. That is me, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and those who follow me. Basira, in my humble understanding, is an ability to look into the future. Not in the sense of a, 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 uh, a toothsayer. Not in the sense of somebody with tarot cards, you know, flip the card and say, this is what the future is going to look like. That's not, that's not Basira. Basira is, I'll give you a good example. Basira is, and somebody shared this with me the last time I gave a presentation. Basira is the talk that Abu Kalam Azad gave when this debate was going on about the future of Muslims in India. You must listen to that. That's available. It's available. You will have some understanding of, of the genius of this human being and how prescient he was, how he was able to look into the future. It's not a looking into the future because you have some kind of ilm al -ghayb. It's all the, 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 the collective knowledge of your experience, your ilm, and your multiple encounters with hikmah, and you can look into the future. That this is what Muslim India will look like 40 years from today. He was spot on. He was spot on. Very few people have that. Very few people have that kind of internal radar that allows you to look into the future. See, this is what is likely to happen. What is likely to happen to us, with us in America in the next 25 to 30 years as a Muslim community? I don't know. There are people who are highly prized. Their, their intellect and their abilities are prized. They are worth millions of dollars simply because they can look into the future. There is this guy from Israel called Yuval uh, Harari. Brilliant man who looks into the future. And people who talk to him are like the president of the United States, Obama, the, the, the uh, secretary of the European Union, well, tell us, what do you think Europe would look like? What do you think is the problem with immigration? So he tells you that this, the latest thing he talks about is artificial intelligence and, and the future of humanity. To be able to talk at that level, you need this kind of basira. Not everyone has it. It comes to you. It comes to you because you have all the rest of it. You can't have this just like that. You can't have it just like that. You have to have a certain amount of knowledge. You must know the landscape. You must know how the world operates. The one sense in which the Quran uses basira and it applies to the human beings is on the day of hisab. Because then you have full basira. Basira means be able to look forward. But if you can look forward and backwards, then you have full basira, you understand? And on the day of hisab, on the hisab you have a 360 understanding of, of, of who you are and what your relationship is and what your, your a'mal and your, and, and your acts are. You have full understanding of that. So that's where the Quran uses the word basira. Otherwise, all of the time it uses the basira, it is the basira of Allah. And obviously Allah has that basira. His knowledge is forward-looking, backward-looking, upward-looking, sideways-looking. So he can really tell you what's going on. So if you, can, if you can grab some of that, or if it comes to you, then you are indeed fortunate. 
وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين. Do you have any questions, comments? What do you have? Five minutes. Mm-hmm. Salam. Okay, let's just take just take the question quickly because he, because we have five. How many minutes? Five, six minutes. All right, go. That's a good that's a good comment. Very, very observant. You're right. So Basira is kept limited because society will become dysfunctional. So very few people are given that insight for for good reason. Because then we wouldn't all be towing the same line, you understand? And for society to be functional, everyone must tow the same line. You need someone with this kind of basira to tell you, standing in the front, okay, you stop, you can't go this way anymore, go that way. Good point, thanks. What is, how does istikhara go into a hadith? It doesn't. Istikhara is, is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was on, was on constant istikhara. Although there's a hadith that says, I, I never did anything without making istikhara. But that, I think, is largely, is largely to, uh, to, e- to educate us. Rasulullah was in constant contact with the divine. Constant contact. So when you do istikhara, you're asking for divine intervention. But will that actually the right decision? No, it, it, it will. But I want to keep it on one side because I'm talking about things that only things that are self-generated. Although we believe that ultimately wisdom comes from Allah and, and knowledge comes from Allah, but there's some things that you and I strive for. And in istikhara, what are we doing? We're delegating that, that to Allah and says, help us and do this in a more insightful way. There's some things about istikhara we have to be careful about though. We get the impression that istikhara should be done for everything. You can't possibly be doing istikhara for faraid. Should I make dhuhr today or shouldn't I make dhuhr today? Should I go for hajj? Maybe. That, 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 you might have an istikhara argument there. But there's some things there's no istikhara. Should I eat this haram or should I not eat the haram? So when people talk istikhara, you're talking about things that are not clear. Things that are not categorically categorized. Okay, next question. Well, the, the end result of your hikmah is your furqan, the ability to, to separate the one from the other. That's the, the, the to make that, that, that tafriqa, that separation, to be able to discern the two. That is a part of hikmah, in the category of hikmah. Good point. Yes. It might. It might. Very, very good. Good question. Uh, wrong premise. Knowledge might beget wisdom. We have evidence right around us that what does it not do? Not to everyone. It does not beget wisdom to everyone. That's why the Quran is very explicit. And whosoever, not like everyone gets it, whosoever is given this wisdom is given a great amount. That's right. Absolutely. Ladies, no. Whether it, whether it comes from the outside or the inside. It's, it's a mixture of the two. Hikmah is all yours. Hmm? 
No, you, you don't have to do that. Because ultimately, you want to use it to, 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 to solve a problem, right? So you, you're not going to ask yourself, well, is this ilm or is this hikmah or not? So, so I, I, gave you some, I tried to give you some examples of what would be what would be ilm and what? Ilm is, 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 is organic. It, it's incremental. In ilm, you, 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 mathematics is ilm. It's a very good example of, of if you don't know, you know, level one, you can't get to level two. Level one and level two are connected. Level two and level three are connected. And in fact, the one is a presupposition for the other. It's a prerequisite for the other. So that's a, you, can, you can identify ilm very easily because it's organic, it grows, and it's connected. Wisdom or hikmah doesn't come that way. It is the choice you make at a particular moment when you are navigating uncharted territory. When you have to do something that has come to you for the first time, something that you have never learned about. When do you know to hold your tongue? Simple example. When do you know to hold your tongue? When do you know to speak? Simple examples of that. There's no school for that. When do you know to make that particular comment? And when not to make that comment? When do you know which fight to pick and which fight not to pick? It's not your ability to fight that matters. It's your wisdom to choose your fights. It's not your ability to fight. It's your wisdom to choose the fights. Now, all fights are not worth getting into. Look at the catastrophe we're suffering because of the fights we get into. Without any wisdom. So these are all examples of how wisdom comes to you. And, and the more you exercise it, the more you exercise it, the, the, the better you become at it. The better you become at it. There's a story of Suleiman, I'm trying to remember it, where he had to choose between, I think it's Suleiman alayhi salam. Don't quote me on it. He had to choose between a real flower and an artificial flower, just by looking at it. And he looked at it for a while, and then he picked the right one. So afterwards, they asked him, how did you pick the right one? He said, I didn't pay attention to the flower. I paid attention to the insects that circle around it. Get it? I paid attention to the insects that circle around it. All right? Well, asr inna l-insan illa fi khusr illa al-ladhina amanu wa amilu s-salihat wa tawasabu al-haqqi wa